Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Inside Boxing Weekly, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, a new interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense will do in a live NFL game and see what all others have called also. So check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I want to welcome in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer. Good evening, Mike. Excited to be on. Excited to talk about the fight this weekend. Most definitely, and we have a special guest to talk about the fight. Help me welcome former light heavyweight contender, John the Iceman Scully. How you doing, John? Everything's great. Good to, good to be here with you guys. All right, so Jeremiah, we've been waiting for a big fight all year. We finally got one. It's actually a pay-per-view I might might even buy, just as on the off chance I can't find it for free on the computer. Um, so I'll pose this question to both of you guys. I'll go with Jeremiah first, but it... Is this the biggest light heavyweight title fight in history? Oh, is it the is it the is it the biggest? <clears throat> that is a tough call. I mean, is it the biggest? Uh, honestly, I mean, I wasn't around in the mid '80s for things like Spinks and Kali, so it's hard to say. I mean, it certainly it has more hype than some of the recent bouts, like uh, you know Dawson and Hopkins and Tarver and Hopkins, and and on and on and on. Any of the Roy Jones Jr.'s fights. Um, so is it the biggest in history? Um, I can't say, um, but it's certainly the biggest in a number of decades. All right, John. Uh, you know, you've had some, some huge light heavyweight fights. Uh, Spinks Huawei was big. Um, you know, Virgil Hill and Henry Maskey was, was huge at the time, especially overseas. Uh, I think they set all kinds of records, uh, for that fight. Uh, um, you know, so many, uh, Bob Foster fights, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's up there. It's definitely up there. Um, I think uh, uh, for whatever reason, I don't think, you know, we live in a different era. Like, and maybe because Kovalev is, is Russian, a lot of Americans might not be completely familiar with him. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it's getting the buzz that it deserves. You know, I think, I, like, I've talked to a few people recently uh, on the Internet, and they didn't even realize it was this week. You know, they didn't even realize the fight was, was coming up so soon. Um, you know, I wish there was there was more attention to it because I think, in terms of big fights in the last say three four years, um, with Pacquiao Mayweather being the the benchmark, I, I think this is a, a better fight than Pacquiao Mayweather could ever hope to be. And and I and I'm actually more intrigued and interested in it than I was in that fight. Uh, you know, so that for, so for me it's a it's a huge fight. Probably in the last ten years, it's certainly the biggest. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the one that really stood out to me, he talked about Spinks and Dwight Braxton. And, I mean, really, I mean, I know Jeremiah is not old enough to remember it. I am. I think John, we're close to the same age. But that fight was kind of the same thing. For boxing people, it was a huge fight. But I don't think it had really a buzz outside of boxing. Right, right. Spinks, Spinks and Braxton was, in terms of boxing people, it was a super fight. But because it wasn't a mainstream fight, it, it was I believe it was on HBO. I remember watching it and, and uh uh at home. Um you know, so we, we live in a different world now where fights really need to be built up and, and there's only a certain few guys that can be in those type of fights. Um if this was back then when when, when the network T V was on, and I think that's a, that was a big factor because both Braxton and Spinks were regularly on network T V every weekend, so they had different exposure than these two guys do today. So I think that that's a big part of the reason why. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the fight. I mean, we'll go, Jeremiah, we'll act like you're trading Kovalev. What is the one thing that he has to accomplish in the ring in order to beat Ward? Well, in my opinion, I think he needs to out-jab Ward. I mean, Ward is an excellent jabber. He's a smart jabber. He'll go to the body. He'll go to the head. Um, but as you see, you know, in the past, I mean, guys who have great jabs, Sometimes they can be out jabbed. I mean, we saw that with Ali and Norton and others. Um, so, in my opinion, Kovalev has to establish the jab. He's got to be smart with it, and uh, you know, establish the distance. And again, just just out jab work. I mean, that's going to set the tone for the fight. I see both of them, you know, trying to you know parlay one another's jabs, trying to get it in there. Um, and Ward has to win the jab, or I mean, sorry, Kovalev has to win the jabbing contest. I think to win the fight. Yeah, um, John, same question for Kovalev. Uh, what does he have to accomplish in the ring in order to beat Ward? 
I actually that that's a beautiful answer. I uh, I actually did a preview for our website uh, the other day, or actually the, a magazine in England, and I said pretty much the same thing. Where Kovalev, I think, has a very good jab. People don't necessarily talk about his jab, but I think it's very very uh, good, and I think he has great timing with it, and he's very strong with it. Um, and I th- I think that's his big key. He's going to have to have offset Ward as Ward. Ward's going to try and be, I would assume Ward will try and be slippery and, and use a lot of angles and, and that type of thing. Um, Ward has a different kind of jab. Uh, you know, he, he tries to he tries to box with it and, and place it, and he mixes it up, up and down. But uh, I think I think Kovalev's is much heavier, and it kind of cuts through, uh, you know, the defenses of, of a slick guy. Um, and I, I think Kovalev's jab, if he doesn't get it going, he's going to have a lot of problems. Yeah, and I think one problem that I would worry about with Kovalev also is he can't let Ward get two, three, four, five, six rounds ahead early. And I mean, because I think he has to establish his power and his strength and his boxing abilities coming right out of the gate. Um, what do you think about that, John? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think he needs to let Andre know right away that this is that kind of fight because Andre's the type of guy, you know, sometimes you go in with a guy that you, that you not necessarily fear, but a guy you have great respect for, and all of a sudden he, he doesn't really turn the jets up right away, and you start getting confident, and then by the time he turns it on, you're already comfortable and you're already in a groove. And, um, you know, so I think Kovalev needs to, everything that Ward and everyone thinks he is, he needs to show them, show Andre right away that, that yes, I am what they say I am. I, I have that strength. I have that presence because, um, you know, he can't let Andre get into a kind of groove because, uh, you know, Andre's the type of guy, once he hits that rhythm, it's, it's going to be hard to beat him. Yeah, well, and yeah. Jeremiah, I think if you look at it, I think the biggest visible advantage Kovalev has has to be his punching power. Yeah, it has to be. And yeah, I was going to go to back to the jab about that. I mean, uh, Kovalev has knocked guys out with jabs. I mean, that's how devastating his jab is. If I'm not mistaken, he broke, uh, I think, one of C- Cedric Agnew's ribs with a jab. I mean, so this is, you know, it, it is the power. I mean, and, and certainly he's going to have to use that. Uh, but like he showed against Bernard Hopkins, that's not all he is. He showed a good boxing brain. He showed that he can box smartly when he needs to. Uh, and he showed that he can use a jab against a good, smart boxer. Um, and, of course, here he's going to have to use it, and he's going to have to not only dedicate himself to the jab, um, but dedicate himself to the straight right hand. I mean, if any shot has the potential to land, any shot that he, he also needs to get in rhythm with, it's it's a straight right hand. I mean, and with uh, Andre Ward's chin, again, I, I don't think there are a lot of question marks surrounding it, but I think, you know, he can be hurt. I mean, he, he was knocked down by Darnell Boone. I know that was earlier in his career. And he was also stunned a bit by Kenny Cost in one of his earlier fights as well. So Kovalev has to get in there and, you know, and make Ward – um, intimidated by his power. Yeah, and I think the biggest advantage Ward has just going in looking on the outside, John, has to be ring generalship. Right. Intelligence goes a long, long, long ways. And, uh, you know, there's no secret that Andre needs to be smart. You know, people, you know, I heard, I heard some people saying, like, oh, it's going to be a great slugfest. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think Andre and Virgil are way too smart for that. Uh, you know, you you win the way that, that you have to win and the way that you're capable of winning. And he's got to be smart. And if I was his trainer, I mean, I would say, let's be the smartest guy on earth. Let's let's box the way that you obviously know you have to. Like, it doesn't take a genius to figure out how an Andre Ward would have to beat a, a Sergey Kovalev. It's not a big, big, big secret, I don't think. Um, so... I, uh, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for a, a master boxing performance, and he's you know he's going to need it because uh, Kovalev is going to be very you know hyped up about the fight, and and he's going to be uh, like like Superman on steroids mentally. You know he's going to be really pushing the issue. So I think um, he's going to bring the best out of Andre. All right, and I, I think the biggest question about Ward is his last three fights. He had Brand Barrera, Paul Smith, not great fighters, just solid guys. He had two or three years off before that. Do you think that maybe with the lack of competition, I mean, he hasn't been in against a top-quality fighter probably in four or five years. Do you think that's a big deal there, John? Uh, normally I, I would. Um, you know, it's been literally 
four years in one month, two months since he fought Chad. Uh, you know, that's a long time. Time is flying. Um, but to his credit, uh, he's not like most guys. I'm sure, just going on my, my instincts, I'm sure that he keeps himself in great shape. He's been sharp for four years working out, and, you know, I don't think he's gained a ton of weight. I've never seen pictures of him where he was very heavy. Um, so I think he's his four-year layoff – it's not a layoff, but so to speak, uh, layoff from elite competition – is different than other guys taking a similar layoff. I, I think he's maintained his sharpness to, um, better than most guys would in that time. All right, Jeremiah, same question. No, I, I, I agree with John. I mean, Ward's style is conducive to longevity. I mean, he's a, he's a smart guy. He's not a guy who gets hit a lot, uh, even though he's, he's better rounded than I think Kovalev is. And he's been on the inside, like when he fought Kessler, he was pretty up in his face. Um, he, you know, again, he didn't take a lot of punishment. So if I, you know, was Andre Ward's coach, um, I'm doing what John said. I mean, just box smartly. I mean, do what you have to do. Uh, you know, faint. Uh, or try to bait Kovalev in so you can counterpunch him. Uh, if you have to get on the get on the inside and rough him up, because there's one thing I haven't do, seen Kovalev do a lot of. It's not a lot of infighting. I mean, his game is predicated on distance. You know, he loves jabbing, loves throwing the right hand. Uh, you know, he mixes in the hook as well. I mean, he does a lot of good, you know, overall, but I don't see uh, – I've never seen him do a lot of infighting. So if I was Ward, you know, mix it up, try to bait him in, and if you have to, you know, if you, if you are losing the jabbing battle – um, somehow, then you know, get inside, rough them up, uh, get a little dirty if you have to, and win that way. All right. So the big question, John, who do you got in this fight? Well, I uh, when I initially heard about the fight, I was my first thought was that I was going to go with uh, Kovalev. I, I thought he's too strong, and, and you know, he's really in a groove now the way he's been fighting. But um, you know, as, as I thought about it more. Uh, I just feel like Andre is is very sharp, very smart, and I think you know Virgil is a very, very keen guy, very intelligent guy with his boxing, and I think that they know the fight they have to fight, and that he obviously has the skills and the the physical ability to pull it off. Um, now it's one of those fights. I wouldn't be shocked if I wouldn't be shocked if Kovalev caught him with a bomb, like just a, too much pressure, and caught him with a bomb and stopped him. Like that wouldn't shock me at all. No, no offense, to Andre, at all. But uh, if I had to bet, I think I'm going to go with Andre winning a decision, being being very smart, and uh, maybe digging his heels in a little bit when he has to. Um, but uh, you know, overall, boxing a scientific fight and and coming away with a decision. All right, Jeremiah. Well, once again, I'm in agreement with John. <clears throat> I think I think Ward is just, again, like I said earlier, I think he's a bit better rounded. Um, you know, he just seems a bit smarter. I think his competition overall has actually been a bit better. Uh, he showed more style nuance, in my opinion. Though I think Kovalev is, you know, he's much more than, you know, just a one-punch knockout artist. I just haven't seen... Uh, I just haven't seen the the quality from his stuff that I have Ward. Ward has uh, overcome all sorts of styles uh, at the top level, and I, I just favor, again, his well-roundedness. I, I think, you know, if he's losing a particular engagement, like I said, the jabbing battle, I think he can revert to another style and win that way. With Kovalev, I, I haven't quite seen all of that. He's done very well in, in you know, the vast majority of his performances, but I'm not quite sure that he has, uh, again, the well-roundedness, and I don't think he's quite as smart. Uh, but also, like John, uh, you know, if, if Kovalev wins, wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me either. My, my big question is the level of competition he's just faced. I think Ward has faced guys similar to Kovalev, possibly. He's fought some really good guys like Froch, um, Abraham, Kessler, I mean, Chad Dawson. You look at Kovalev, on the other hand, I don't think he's seen anything like Ward. And what I brought up earlier about what I think will happen is, I think that it's going to take Kovalev five or six rounds to really gauge what he's in with. And I think by then it's too late. I think he you know, puts a little pressure on him towards the end of the fight, wins a few rounds. But I see something like an eight-to-four decision for Ward. But, yeah, um, he, 
Go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, maybe Ward gets to play, play a little prevent defense, huh? Maybe he outboxes him and just kind of gets in a groove and stays there. Yeah, Kovalev's going to have to jump on it soon. But, all right, um, John, thanks a lot for coming yes, in to give us your take on the fight. I appreciate it, and uh, you know I look forward to uh, maybe talking to you guys after the fight. So, like I said, oh, I'll most definitely, definitely if you want, we can go ahead and set that up now for next Sunday night. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, let me see. Uh, touch base with me during the week because I'm working on my flight coming back, and as of right now, my flight is actually going to be around this time on Sunday night. Well, we could probably, we could do it Monday night too if you want. I think that would be better. Yeah, that would be better. Okay, well, we'll definitely, I'll be in touch with you towards the end of this week, weekend, and we'll set something up. All right, sounds great. Uh, great being with you guys, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks a lot, John. All right, guys. All right, All right guys, um, let's go ahead, and we previewed the fights that were coming up this week, or this last weekend, last week. So I figured we'd go ahead and talk about those a little bit. Um, we'll start off with Luis Ortiz. Unanimous decision over Malik Scott. I know that Ortiz's people were so upset about it that they're actually trying to get him on a December 10th Joshua Molina undercard because, as Ortiz's manager said, Scott didn't even attempt to win the fight. He kind of basically just showed up and tried to survive. Um, what was your take, Jeremiah? Oh, it was, uh, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a contender for uh, – worst fight of the year. I mean, it wasn't much better um, than Fury Klitschko, if better at all. Uh, it, Scott did nothing but try to, to win. I mean, he Scott hit the ground, what, seven, eight times in total, and three of those were officially ruled as knockdowns. And the referee, he, he was just awful. I mean, I, at, at one point he was actually helping Scott up after a knockdown. Um, <laughs> That Scott just he didn't show up, and, and unfortunately for Louis, Louis Ortiz, who a lot of people have have hyped up, um, Ortiz did not look like the killer he was against um, well, in his last fight, in his last few fights. Yeah, um, but I, I think a lot of that is this, though. I mean, you remember Mike Tyson fighting Mitch Blood Green? I know you're not old enough, but I'm sure you've seen the tape. I, I, yeah, I've, I've seen all of Tyson's fights. Kind of the same thing there. If somebody's not, I mean, if somebody is hell bent on just surviving. They usually do. It's true, but I, I I don't think Ortiz did enough to cut off the ring. He looked a little bit one-dimensional, in my opinion. He just kind of plotted forward and, and didn't really look to press the action, you know, trying to potch at him with a straight left hand at times. Uh, it wasn't. It just wasn't an impressive performance, and I know a lot of people are disappointing because, uh, I mean, you know, Ortiz is seen as a top contender, and a lot of people thought, you know, he'd be a major player in heavyweight, and he is a major player, but you know, whether he goes on to beat Wilder or Pavetkin or Joshua or any of these top guys, it's, it's tough. I mean, after that performance, I, I wouldn't give uh, Fury a half bad chance of winning. Which Fury? Tyson. Not, not the other what one. Huey. What about Huey nah. or Dewey? <laughs> 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 Who the hell names our kid Huey, by the way? But, I don't um, know. That brings us to probably the only really competitive fight of the weekend, Jason Sosa. Defended his title over Stephen Smith. What's your take on that one? Yeah, Jason Sosa. I mean, from a guy who hasn't had uh, much of an amateur background, he's progressed pretty well. And I assume that part of that is a, a byproduct of you know the Philly culture, and um, uh, you know he's pr- just been getting some good training, and he's also been moved up pretty quickly. So I mean, for a guy with you know his experience and and his amount of fights, he's um. He's done pretty well for himself, and again, I, I see him getting better and better. Um, you know, Stephen Smith, he he was you know valiant in his effort. He tried, and you know, just like he did against uh, Pedroza. You know, he he came in and, and took a crack at it, but Sosa was just a little bit better. He looked like he hit a bit harder. Looked like he just had a little more, uh, uh, you know, some finer qualities to his game. But you know, it was a really good fight, and. Uh, I hope to see Sosa against some of the top guys at 130. In particular, uh, you know, Orlando Salido. I wouldn't mind seeing him against Martinez. I wouldn't mind seeing him against uh, um, Francisco Vargas or Mira. Uh, all of those are really good fights. And I look forward yeah, to Yeah, uh, I think he's being brought along very good by Jay Russell Peltz. I mean, they're not really throwing him in over his head. They're kind of just progressing like you're going up steps. And I think that he has progressed a lot just in the last six months, his last couple fights. 
Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I mean, and a lot of us, when he fought Walters, we were like, who the hell is this guy? And then he, he you know, ekes out a draw, though many of us, you know, thought Walters won. I mean, but, you know, for a guy who had never been in with that type of competition before, he, you know, he performed really well. And now, you know, Walters fight aside, he's, he's, he's looked damn good in his last few fights. All right. He was the, bring... No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say he was the underdog in his last fight, um, I think against uh, Javier Fortuna, and ended up stopping him. Yeah, he looked really good in that fight, too. Mm-hmm. Um, brings us to Danny Garcia. Or, I mean, as as we thought, he knocks out Samuel Vargas in seven rounds, TKO. Any take on that? Kind of what we expected. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was what we expected. I mean, but to Danny Garcia's credit, you know what I was doing as, as I was watching the fight? Is I was trying to see, because of all the hype surrounding Errol Spence, I was trying to see who looked better against Vargas. You know, was it Spence or was it was it Danny Garcia? And in my opinion, they were about on par with one another. I mean, uh, in my opinion, Spence looks naturally bigger than Garcia, but Garcia looked damn good. I mean, but he should look damn good against a guy of that caliber. Uh, but, you know, given the fight, I mean, it's just a tune-up, thankfully. I mean, if, if the Thurman fight wasn't lined up, then we'd all be real disappointed in Garcia. But, I mean, the highlight of the night was not really him beating Vargas. We all expected that. But the fact that, you know, Thurman got in the ring and they all started talking shit, and, and now we can look forward to that showdown in uh, March. So who do you lean towards right now? I, I lean towards Thurman. I, I think Garcia is a good fighter. He does a lot of things well, um, but he doesn't look like a great fighter. Um, and in some of his, you know, tougher fights, he struggled a bit. Um, but the difference for me is that I think Furman hits a little bit harder at 147, and Danny Garcia just has a tendency too much to rely on wide punches. He hooks a lot. And I think Thurman, um, he, he relies mostly on straight punches. So I think Thurman takes it. Uh, Thurman showed a little bit grit. I think Garcia has a little grit too, but uh, Thurman showed a little grit against, uh, against Porter. I think it'll be a good fight, but I think Thurman will take it. All right. So any more updates you want to talk about boxing-wise? Boxing-wise, yeah. Um, I think uh, some of us are are surprised that Kel Brook said that he would be defending his 147-pound uh, uh, belt. Uh, he's going to be taking on his mandatory Errol Spence. Uh, a lot of people who are Errol Spence fans, and there's a lot of them now, um, said that Brooke won't even bother. They said he was afraid of him, which makes no damn sense. I mean, why would yeah. you fight Golovkin? You're taking on Golovkin, a proven entity, you know, and you're afraid of Errol Spence. Yeah, I actually, but, 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 but the thing is there, maybe not so much afraid, but it's a bigger risk to fight Errol Spence. Nobody thinks right. you're going to beat Golovkin. It's a no-lose situation. Right, and the payout isn't as big. But, uh, you know, from what I hear, this, this fight is going to take place in the U.K., um, which is, you know, home field advantage for, you know, Kel Brook, who already has some experience against top-level opposition. Uh, I think it's good, and I'm happy about it, because I thought, I honestly thought Brook would go to 154 because, you know, maybe he was struggling too much to, to boil down. Um, but the division, uh, the welterweight division is better off with Kel Brook. So I'm excited for this fight, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly be tuning in. All right, anything else? Uh, well, I don't know. I've, I've heard that, you know, maybe Deontay Wilder might fight Huey Fury, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, how. I saw that today, but, I mean, who's Huey Fury beating? N- well, nobody, really. Um, so, I mean, Basically, I'm, I'm he's, he's living off being Tyson Fury's brother, correct? <laughs> well, he's a, I've, I've seen him fight. He's a, He looks solid. I mean, he's a top... British yeah, but he hasn't prospect. done anything to deserve a shot at Deontay Wilder. No, right. And, well, and I, I don't understand. I mean, Deontay Wilder should be fighting Povetkin. I mean, that's the only guy he should really be focused yeah, on. Yeah, but they're going to protect him because he's a meal ticket, and we're not really sure how good he is yet. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, shit, after 37 fights, we should know how good you are. Yeah, but when you're fighting 37 guys like he's fought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and again, therein lies the problem. I mean... You know, thirty thirty seven fights to take. You know, to understand what you've got is it's just one too many. I mean, we're all we're all you know happy to see an American heavyweight who who is, you know, uh, you know up there. You know, a guy who may potentially take over. I'm not convinced personally, but you know, he's he's up there. He's he's a he's a potential heir to the throne. Him and Joshua, it looks like. 
Um, but, I mean, again, 37 fights? I mean, look what Joshua's already done. I mean, I don't know Joshua had a longer amateur background, but, I mean, Joshua is a trinket holder after so many fights, and it took, what while they're like 35 fights. I mean, we we got we to gotta up the competition here. Yeah. Um, but at least we got a fight to watch this week. Exactly. I'm really excited about Kovalev and Ward. Oh, me too. Yeah, I mean, and I was tossed around the... I was tossing around the idea. I was like, you know, I'm just wondering who might have matched. And I think John was right in saying that this fight night might not be getting enough hype around it. You know, and it, it but it hype is around my house in my head, though. That's all that matters. Well, I mean, even if it's not getting the kind of hype that like Pacquiao Mayweather got, in terms of quality, you know, these guys are arguably in their primes, and you know, they're you know they're in. Uh, a class, you know, an original eight weight class, and whoever wins this, in my opinion, this, you know, this is to decide who the best at 175 is. I mean, Stevenson isn't trying to participate, so you know, that's how I see it. Yeah, and I mean, hopefully Stevenson will participate and fight the winner, though, which is another fight that, in my head, is a huge fight. It is, it is. But the problem with Stevenson is he's what 38. He's He's aging quickly, and with his activity rate, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. All right, so I guess we are done for another week. It sounds like next week, probably Monday or Tuesday, we'll have the fight to review the show, plus I think Lomachenko and Walters is coming up in another week or two, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'm excited for that one. So John Scully will be back. He's been texting me for the last five minutes, so I know that he will be back. So and it's always good to have John on because John knows his stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely one of the better guests that's, that we've had. Yeah, and I mean, John was a hell of a fighter too. I mean, he gave Michael Nunn all he could handle. That yeah. was probably before your time too, wasn't it, Jeremiah? Certainly was. I mean, uh, <laughs> honestly, I I actually only really got into boxing in 2004. Yeah. What were you doing before that? <laughs> Yeah, well, I used to be, I mean, I grew up watching guys like Dan Marino play football and stuff. I, you know, I was watching, you know, Michael Jordan in his prime and stuff. So I grew up a sports fan. It's just, you know, boxing was just kind of one of those fringe sports that I never came around to. And then one day I watched ESPN and Teddy Atlas was calling a fight on, I think, Tuesday or Friday night fights. And it was Lamar Murphy versus uh, Damian Fuller. And he just made it sound so damn beautiful. I was like, this is my fucking sport. (laughs) Well, hell. Um, I, I'll tell you, with me, it was basically from the time I was born. I, I mean, because as John talked about, fights like this used to be on ABC prime time on a Monday or Tuesday night. Yeah, and unfortunately, I didn't get that sort of stuff when I was, you know, when I was younger. Again, it was always a fringe sport. I mean, you had to, you know, it was on ESPN yeah, it, sometimes. It became a fringe sport because of pay-per-view, HBO, Showtime, all the big money they were giving them. And then, you know, it was supposed to be dangerous. And I know, I mean, I was 13, 14 years old sitting there watching Ray Mancini fight Dooku Kim. And after that fight, it seemed like slowly it started to come off. I think freaked a lot of people out. Somebody just died on TV in front of them on a Saturday afternoon. Mm-hmm. You know, and with our culture, everybody freaks out. But mm-hmm. uh, you, you couldn't t- I remember watching Muhammad Ali. On broadcast TV, fight Leon Spinks the second time to win his title back. That fight would cost you $150 on a pay-per-view now. Wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, well, the undercard was Danny Little Red Lopez fighting. The undercard was, I think that was Marvin Johnson against Victor Galendez. You know, and I remember cards with Sugar Ray Leonard when he fought Wilfred Benitez, which would be a pay-per-view fight nowadays. And I think Vito Anafermo fought Marvin Hagler on the undercard. I mean... I mean, that's when boxing was good. If he was, like, 15 years older, you'd understand. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, unfortunately, those days days are gone. But, I mean, hopefully, you know, we're always hoping for some white knight to ride up on his horse and have some damn foresight and get this sport together. Yeah, well, what the hell. Until then, we got Kovalev and Ward. That's right. That'll do. All right, guys, make sure you check out The Grueling Truth at thegruelingtruth.net. Um, tonight we did our college football pick 'em show, which you can hear if you go on there now. Um, we'll have the NFL pick 'em show with former Denver Bronco Mark Cooper. 
Of course, our Los Angeles Rams show with former Los Angeles Ram Tony Hunter. He also does a Notre Dame weekly show that you can check out also. Um, check out our Legends show, which our last interview was former Cincinnati Bengal Pro Bowler Tim Crumry. Um, and don't forget, Gridiron Mo, great football app. You can check it out at www.gridironmo.com. You can hear all our shows on iHeart, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Music, pretty much any place you can find a sports podcast, you'll find the grilling truth. So for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak. <laughs>